still, be still. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. He says, be still and know that I am God. Well, good morning. It's really fun to be here again. Good, to, uh, always good to be back. Uh, it feels kind of like home. So uh, I appreciate you welcoming me back out. I had a wonderful drive out this morning with a spectacular sunrise. Uh, wonderful to see kind of the beauty of creation. It's also fun to be here for baptisms and see the beauty of salvation. So it's been a wonderful uh, time this morning. And if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to um, Mark chapter 4 because that's uh, the passage that we'll be looking at. Um, you know, as you look at me, you can probably guess that it was a while ago that I was in college. And for some reason, I was thinking about this the other day and thinking, what do I actually remember from having been in college? And, uh, you know, you think about this, you hear an awful lot of lectures when you go through four years of college. And then you, like I was involved in Campus Crusade for Christ, so I'd hear talks there. I'd go to church, I'd hear talks there. And I'm trying to think, what content do I actually remember from being in college? It's kind of depressing especially for a guy who's a professor. I mean, I, I, I make my living giving talks, right? And I'm like, what do I actually remember from all this stuff? And one of the things that came back to mind as I thought about this was a, a meeting I was in. I can't remember exactly who was speaking, but I was sitting with a friend of mine named Steve. And he was a, he was a good friend. He's a guy I really enjoyed. Interesting guy. He didn't necessarily talk a lot, but he was really thoughtful when he did. And I always appreciated that uh, about him. Uh, so anyhow, we were sitting there and the person was talking about anxiety and worry and things like that. And it was one of those talks that kind of, it made it sound like all this worry stuff is kind of a really simple thing. And if you follow what I just gave you, all of those things will go away. And I'm walking out with Steve and he kind of pauses, you know, takes a deep breath. So I'm thinking, hey, something profound's coming up. Steve, he paused, deep breath. I mean, so he says, you know, the reason people worry is because there's things to worry about. And I thought, well, as profound goes, that may not quite set the needle, but I got to thinking about it. And, and then he talked a little more, and I thought, you know, he's, he's right. The reason we worry about things is that there really are things to worry about. And the bottom line is there's nothing you can say in a talk or some other thing to suddenly change the world so that there's nothing left in the world to make you worry. Because the bottom line is the reason we worry is that there's things to worry about. So if you're hoping to come to uh, church this morning, hear a message, you know, we're having a series on fear and stillness. I saw the pictures that you had out there before, burning buildings and things like this. So, hey, if you're, if you're living in a burning building right now or feels like you are and you're hoping, hey, Rick's going to come and put the fire out, well, <laughs> kind of not so much. Here's the plan. Is, is not to make the fears go away, but to get the fears in their proper place. Because the problem usually with fear is not the mere fact that you have it, because as we say, there are things to be afraid of, but rather things have gotten out of place. And it's an interesting thing that happens when you do that, is your fears become big and the fears begin to run wild, there's other things that ought to be going on in your soul, right? There's nothing wrong with having a fear perhaps in your soul, but there should be other things too. A soul is a place for love and for hope and for joy and for gratitude and all these other things. And it's funny what happens when fear starts to run roughshod over your soul, it pushes everything else out of place. And you find it hard to love the things that you should love. You find it hard to be hopeful for the things in which you should have hope you find it hard to be grateful for the good things that happen in your life. And you realize, you know, the problem here isn't simply that I fear, but that my fear has run amok. My fear is out of place. And we need to get it back to the place where it really belongs. So this is really a story. This is a passage that actually deals with that very much. Um, and the hope, just to be clear at the outset, is not that at the end of this message, that I, now I know how to make all my fears go away but now I know where my fears actually belong 
and perhaps equally importantly, know where they don't belong. So let me take a look at, at um, Mark chapter 4. It's a very familiar story. There's a story of Jesus uh, um, calming the storm. It's one of our favorite stories about the life of Christ, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, but it's a fairly short story. And let me just read it, and uh, then we'll take a look at some of the things that, that uh, Mark records in the story. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And the other boats were with him. So there's a little batch of boats going out across the uh, Sea of Galilee here. Um, and a windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. So these waves are crashing into the boat. But Jesus, he was asleep in the stern on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke. And then he rebuked the wind and the sea and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who is this then that even the wind and the sea obey him? Interesting story. And so what I'd like to do is basically talk about two things. One is to look some at the text of the story itself, talk a little bit about the setting and then some of the key phrases and things that happen in the narrative. And then what I'd like to do is, is to draw a few lessons from that. And really all I'm trying to do is unpack what I think the point of this was for the disciples because it's something about fear and how to get our fears rightly ordered. So what are some things that we can do to get fears in a place where they might actually belong? within our souls. So first, regarding the text itself, regarding the setting of the text, uh, it's been an interesting point in the book of Mark because what is just preceded is a whole set of parables. Uh, parables about the kingdom, parables about the way the kingdom living should work, things like that. And this is the juncture where that all changes. The verses before kind of wrap that up. And now we move into a series of events, things that happen. So we go from parables, a batch of teaching, to events, a little batch of history. And as we do that, in effect, we're moving from theory to practice. A batch of ideas were conveyed in the parables. That's how Jesus would convey those things. With those kind of wrapped up, it's like, okay, now it's time to go put it into practice. And they hop in a boat together to get the project going. And of course, as it turns out, the project doesn't really go so well, but hey, that's the plan, right? This is a transition that we find ourselves in, and a batch of things are coming on the other end that are like this. First, they cross an ocean, then they meet a guy who's a demoniac, uh, who's you know, possessed by demons. They meet somebody whose uh, daughter is dying. They meet a woman who's been sick for uh, however many dozen years, and these are these events that come down on the back side. So that's where this story fits in the middle of this package. Now let me just pick up a couple of really interesting or important phrases in this. The first phrase says, let us go to the other side. Now that doesn't sound like a stunner of a phrase, but let me just make this simple observation. This is one of these great moments in the, in the gospels where Jesus said, let's go to the other side. And you know what the disciples did? Exactly what Jesus said. It's amazing. Half the time these guys are going off doing like the exact wrong thing when Jesus tells them this, they're doing that. And there's all this chaos that they seem to generate by never getting it in terms of what Jesus is doing. This time Jesus said, let's go to the other side. He said, great. And they picked them up and they put them in the boat and they, they went to the other side. Uh, now the reason I point this out is because we have a knack when we, and it may be that you feel like right now you're living in the burning building, you're feeling like things are all chaotic, you feel like you're in the middle of the storm. You know what we usually do is we assume that somehow the reason this bad thing has happened to us is because we've disobeyed Jesus. We have done something wrong, and therefore the bad thing has happened. And of course that's possible, right? I mean, we have the Jonah story where Jesus, or where God tells him, go to Nineveh, and he says, I think I'll go to Tarshish instead. And the next thing you know, wham, he's out on a boat, they get a big storm, they throw him overboard, the fish swallows him up, barfs him out on the beach, um, and it's a really lousy way to spend a week, right? So Jonah is having a really bad time. Why? Because he disobeyed. So no question, that can happen. I'm just saying, it didn't hear. Jesus said, we're crossing over. What did they say? Let's cross over. And what happened? Storm. 
What happened? Things went bad. And it's good to remember that the fact that things has gone bad doesn't mean that you've somehow departed from Jesus. In the midst of the world we live in, following Jesus often entails finding ourselves in the middle of a storm. It doesn't mean something's wrong. It doesn't mean something's out of control. It doesn't mean the world is about to end. Uh, it doesn't mean Jesus isn't on the throne. It just means you are following Jesus into a storm. And that just happens sometimes. And that's what happened here. Now, it's interesting as they're talking about this, you know, storm that they're in. Um, the phrase that's used is, and a great wind arose. Uh, so they're out here on the Sea of Galilee, and all of a sudden the winds start blowing. And let me just remind you, these guys are, you know, experienced fishermen. They're vocational fishermen. They've spent their whole life out on the Sea of Galilee, right? And they're familiar with winds. Winds are not uncommon there. They're a little bit like they are for us here. We get our Santa Ana winds, and when a Santa Ana wind kicks in, it's no big surprise to all of us, right? So here they have a Santa Nazareth wind, or whatever they call them, and it's blowing down the mountain, and everything's, you know, blowing on the sea. But in and of itself, this is not a panic moment for a batch of guys who are fishermen, right? We're in a boat, we're on a lake with a wind. Big deal. But unfortunately, this isn't just a wind. This is a big wind. This is a wind that spins out of control. And suddenly the disciples begin to worry. And the interesting thing is the waves start crashing over the boat. They are filling it up. It says the boat was already filling. So you realize, oh my gosh, this is a real problem. It's kind of like this. You know, when you live in California, it's always interesting what happens if you're in a room like this and an earthquake takes place. Everybody who's lived in California for like 30 years just is like, eh, big deal. Everybody who's fresh here from Kansas <laughs> jumps up with the first tremor. They're halfway back to Wichita before it's even done shaking, and we're not even moving in our seats. We're like, earthquake, big deal. If you've got a room like this full of Californians and you get an earthquake and they empty out, it's the big one. <laughs> That's how you know. And I'm just telling you, this was a big wind. Why? Not because there's a few waves, but because the Californians are freaking out. Okay? These guys are looking and saying, man, we're in trouble. And so back to my story about why do we worry? We worry because there's things to worry about. This was a thing to worry about, okay? When waves start getting into your boat, that isn't how you get seasick in a boat, that's how you get dead. <laughs> the boat sinks and you with it. So there was something to worry about here. There is no question about that. Now, the interesting thing in terms of where does this go from there is, of course, the wind kicks in, they all start to freak out, and they're, they're doing all the things that they need to do, and they turn around, and Jesus is in the back of the boat, sleeping on a cushion. <laughs> and, I, you know, I, I realize they're probably sitting there thinking, he's a carpenter anyhow, who needs him? We're out on a boat, you know. But nonetheless, it's kind of rude if we're going to croak that he just sleeps through it. Um, so they go back and they grab Jesus by his, you know, lapels or whatever you have on whatever he was wearing. And they, you know, they kind of grab him and shake him. It's like... Teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? Uh, they are just, they're blowing a gasket and they grab Jesus and they, 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 they ask him, don't you care that we're perishing? Now notice what's happened. What happened was they had a batch of circumstances that began to go out of control. And you know what it did? It made them not worry about the circumstances, but it made them doubt the character of Jesus. They're suddenly asking the question, Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? You know, two hours ago, I'm sure they weren't asking that question. They were on shore. They just had a great day. They'd been following Jesus. Jesus loved them. They loved Jesus. Everything was just peachy. They hop in a boat. They meet a circumstance. And the next thing you know, they're suddenly asking Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? And that happens to us a lot, right? When you're going good with Jesus and then something happens 
And it may be a disease, it may be an illness, it may be something with a kid, it may be something with your parents, whatever it may be. And suddenly the circumstance gets between you and Jesus. And because of the circumstance, you begin to doubt the character of Jesus. And that's exactly what happened to the disciples in this story. Now, the interesting thing that happens is upon doing that and shaking Jesus, Jesus' response is his great phrase, peace, be still. And of course, the waves ante up, you know. That was God, he just told me, still, I'm still. Um, so that's how this episode goes. But you, you want to enter into this one a little bit more because it's a really interesting story here, right? You know, these guys hop on the boat, they start to pass across. They're a little bit of a wind, a little bit of a wave, a little bit of wind, a little, little wave. Isn't this nice? This is all cool. The wave gets a little big, the wave gets a little splash, get a little water in there. Next thing you know, the waves are getting big and they're crashing against the side of the boat. The wind is blowing and the wind is loud. Once the waves begin to get into the boat, as it says the boat was already filling, that means all the disciples who are in the boat are already bailing because that's what you do when the water starts to get in and it starts to fill, you start to bail. So you have a wind blowing, you have the waves crashing, you have the guys messing with the sail, I don't know what they do, but you know, when you're in a windstorm, they always do something with the sail, and so they're messing with the sail, they're bailing out, they're yelling around, they're looking over, where's Jesus? Jesus is asleep, Peter grabs Jesus, shakes him out and tells, don't you care that we're all dying, and the whole place is screaming and yelling and turbulence and all this, and the way the passage records it, all of this is going on, they grab Jesus, they're yelling at him, and then it says, and then Jesus awoke. I mean, Jesus was like, he was out of it. It had been a long day, okay? So all of this stuff gone. They've grabbed his lapels. They've shaken him up good. And finally, Jesus is like, whoa, what's going on here? And he wakes up and all that's going on, all this noise and people are yelling and all this stuff. And Peter's like, don't you care? We're going to die. And the winds are blowing and the waves are crashing. And Jesus says, I can't hear you, Peter. It's too noisy. Peace be still. <laughs> Great call. And Peter's and he's like, now what was it, Peter? What was the problem? <laughs> and Peter's like, hey, no problem, Lord. We're good. We're going to the other side. <laughs> and just, the, the, you know, this stunning, and even the phrase, and there was a great calm. Sometimes silence is loud, you know, and, and this was one of those moments. And, and so suddenly, like the world is put back in order. And they take a trip on a cross. And Jesus asked them, have you no faith? And remember the theory practice thing? They just heard all the stuff about the kingdom of God and who, who God is and what it means to fall in love. They had a good dose of theory and now they were getting to the lab. And guess what? The theory didn't work well in the lab. That's basically what happened there. The response of the disciples is really interesting here because they look at each other and say, who is this that even the wind and the seas obey him? And then what does it say about him? They were afraid. They were greatly afraid because they suddenly realized, oh my gosh, I'm in the presence of someone who when he says a word, the winds and the wave cease. And they suddenly had that realization that I'm in the presence of God. And they were afraid. And that's the thing that is perhaps most interesting to me about this entire story. This is not a story where the story arc is from fear to calm and peace. This is a story arc that goes from fear of the storm to fear of Jesus. You had fear at the beginning. You have fear at the end. But what's happened is you've changed the object of your fear and somehow the whole world is different for that transition having taken place. And this is what I mean about getting fear in its proper place within your soul. So this is what I want to just dig into a little deeper. And let me just make kind of an observation, the, the quote lessons I, I'm drawing from this. Are, the, the first lesson is that we need to fear Jesus more. Um, and you might say that means simply that you fear him first. You, you fear him more than the storm. The other thing I'd probably say, and we probably need to fear him more than we tend to, because I had this feeling like we tend to think of Jesus as our best buddy somehow. 
And it isn't that he isn't our friend. It isn't that he isn't, you know, for us. But he's more than just that. And that's exactly what the disciples noticed in this moment because they're suddenly like, whoa, who is this person? So I want to think a little bit more about this whole notion of the fear of the Lord, um, which is in effect what you're really seeing here, right? This is them realizing he's Lord and them being afraid of him. And just make the observation that one of the interesting things about fearing the Lord, why we need to learn to fear Jesus more, is that when we fear Jesus more, the rest of our fears somehow get put in order. Uh, interesting lesson uh, or observation uh, statement that, that Augustine made. So this is 1600 years ago. Augustine's talking about human beings and he, he made this interesting observation. He said, you know what? Sin, Satan can create nothing. So when we think he's not God and only God can call things into being. So he said, when, when we think of sin, we always need to think about it as a disordering of something that in and of itself is good but through sin has become disordered, or perhaps a privation. In other words, you, there's something there that would have been good, but somehow it's been taken away by you know, whatever forces that have been done. But it's not like these things inherently are evil. It's that they have been distorted or twisted or somehow removed or dislocated. And, and Augustine's observation about this is regarding our loves. And he says, you know, the problem is that we have disordered loves. It isn't that we wake up in the morning and say, ooh, I want to go love something really terrible. Yeah, it's Terrible Tuesday. I'm going to love something terrible. That isn't how it works, right? We wake up the morning, we love what we love, and usually what we love is good things. There's always an Adolf Hitler or somebody out there who just plain loves evil. But for most of us, that isn't our problem. The problem is we love things that are actually worthy of being loved, but we love them in the wrong order. We love too much the things that are worth too little. And we love too little the things that are worth so much. And so we are people of what you would call disordered, what Augustine calls disordered loves. And that has a bad impact on our souls. My only observation is the same thing is true of fears. We tend to have a bad set of fears mixed around us. Not because there's nothing to fear, but we fear things the wrong way. A great analogy for this uh, was uh, William Temple was talking about this and said the world is like a jewelry store in which some vandals have broken in, but what they did, they didn't steal anything. They just changed all the price tags. So everything really valuable, they put the cheap price tag on, and everything really cheap, they put an expensive price tag on. And we live in a world where all the prices have been disordered. And then we pay for things a lot for things that are worth very little, and we, we give very little for things that might be worth a lot. And so we worry, the same thing happens again with our fears, right? As we end up with our fears not being attached to the thing we should probably be uh, concerned about. A couple of things. Number one is our, our fears get disordered partly because we just have so many. We're afraid of so many different things. We, we worry about this thing. We, oh, I've got to get my job. And then we worry about the economy. We worry about Washington being shut down. And we worry about our neighbor. And we, we have so many different things we worry about. And it's just like your house when you, you wake up morning, you look around and you just go, I have too much stuff. It isn't that I need to put these three things back on the bookshelf. Just know, there's just too many things here. And disorder emerges simply because of the number of things that you are afraid of. Uh, you, you multiply in that sense your fears. Interesting thing though, not only does that make disorder, it is disordering upon our souls. Because we're afraid of all these things, we don't know which way to turn because we look at this one and we're like, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job. Oh, I'm afraid that if this happens, I'm going to lose my relationship with my wife or, or my kids or Washington. Or, and, and we turn this way and that and every way we go is another swirling fear. And our disordered fears become disordering to our souls and to our lives and our lives kind of spin off into chaos of uncontrolled worry. And here's the trick, is to get the first love in place and the first fear in place. This is what Augustine said about the love. says, you, know, you have to start with the love of God at the top. And once you have that love in place, your other loves find their place underneath your first love. And likewise with your fears. If your first fear is fear of God, the other fears find their place underneath that. 
and are ordered by this first love. It's what you might call an ordering love or an ordering fear. And I would simply say the fear of God in that sense is our ordering fear. We get that one in place first and the other things in some sense attached to it. Let me just read a passage of scripture from Isaiah chapter 8 that kind of manifests this nicely. This is a time when things are kind of chaotic in the life of Israel. Isaiah is talking to the king and he says, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear, let him be your dread. Interesting how he says, you guys are worried about many things. All these other people worry about all this. Don't call everything conspiracy that they call it. Don't fear everything that they fear. Uh, let God be your fear. Let him be your dread. And then these other things fall in place. I had an interesting experience with this with, with my dog, Dakota. She's a um, German shepherd. And we would take her for walks, and she'd just go berserk when some other dog would go by. It just, it was not happy for, you know, mom and dad, and it's not happy for doggy doggy. It just, the whole scene was, was ugly. Um, and this is right about the time we moved from Redlands down to Fullerton, and as it turned out, we had like a three-week period when we didn't have a house. And so we were taking the dog with us. We went back to Colorado to see family and friends and stuff, and we had this dog, and we thought, we've got to get this dog problem solved, because otherwise it's going to get ugly for three weeks living out of a car with a crazy dog. So we, we uh, go up to Highland and find the dog whisperer. Um, and I uh, say, look, here's our problem. Our dog goes berserk when you go on a walk, and there's another dog. She doesn't know what to do with herself and all this. And she says, fine, well, let me, let me take the dog. And she had, you know, this kind of gr grass area that they could walk around, and then a batch of kennels, because they, you know, had a kennel in, the, in, in that area too. And so she'd walk Dakota around over here, and then she'd walk by the kennel where all the other dogs are. And the dogs would start to go barking, um, and, you know, they'd walk around. They did this a couple times. She comes back, and she said, yeah, I don't think this will be a big problem. Said, the problem isn't a dog, the problem's you. <laughs> and I'm like, for this we pay $100, thank you so much, you know. And, and she said, no, look, look how this works. She said, I, uh, let me do this again and watch what happens as we walk by the kennel. So she walks the dog around, the dogs start to go crazy, and Dakota looks up at her and then she looks back down and keeps walking. He said, she comes back and said, did you see what happened? The dog looked up at me when the other dog started to bark. So that's how the dog figures out what to do, by looking at you. You become the dog's ordering fear, so to speak. If you're afraid, she'll freak out. If you're not, she'll go, I don't know why they're all barking, but the guy attached to the leash seems cool, so it must be cool and you just keep walking. You become the ordering fear for the dog. And lo and behold, I have really found this to be true. It's almost bizarre. So I was, I'm thinking about this partly because just a couple of days ago, I was taking Dakota out for the walk and we happened to live like a half a block away from the Fullerton uh, wild dog park where everybody gets to do anything they want. And all the dogs are off the leash and you throw the balls and they're running all around and all this sort of stuff. It's a perfect place to do it because the whole park is nicely framed between these two wonderful signs that say, keep dogs on leash. So it's apparently the great place to do this. So anyway, I'm walking Dakota around there and there's a couple of newbie dogs here that don't quite know the dog rules. And so we come walking around the corner there and they're chasing the ball, but they see a new dog coming. They start just flying at us like, you know, these wild dogs. They're barking and they're frolicking and all this kind of stuff. And sure enough, Dakota looks up at me and I look down at her and I'm like, yeah, just dogs, no big deal. And the dogs come flying up, Argh! Skid to halt, and they start sniffing all their relevant dog body parts and, you know, running around like that. And I just keep walking, and Dakota keeps following, and just walk right on with the rest of our walk. Because I was the place where she could drop her fears, so to speak. She dropped the anchor of her fears into her master, in effect. And she realized, as long as I'm on the leash, as long as I'm attached to the master, it's okay. And I figure out how much I'm supposed to be afraid by looking at the person I'm more afraid of, so to speak, my master. Now, I don't beat Dakota. I feed her. 
And she realizes, hey, I gotta treat this guy good because he treats me good. So it isn't that the fear has to be born of this, you know, mortifying sense of, oh, if I bark, he'll flog me when we get home. It's born of devotion. The dog is devoted to me. I have no idea why, but she is. And she looks at me, and if I'm okay, she's okay. And that's the image we get here of Jesus, is our ordering fear. We look at him, we see he's okay, and then we see the rest of our fears in light of our relationship with him. Now let me just take a minute to unpack this uh, just a little bit more, why it is that we should fear God and what that fear really looks like. Um, I'm not sure we have a, a great theology of fear, uh, a great theology of the fear of the Lord. Um, and it, that's not an unfamiliar phrase, right? We know this is in the Bible. We just don't tend to savor it very much. We like to think Jesus is our best buddy, when in fact, though he may be that, he's a whole lot more than that. So let me just take a minute to unpack of some of the more that Jesus is that might set him in a place that he really would sound like our first fear, our ordering fear, that our first regard would be a regard for him. Number one, he's bigger than anything else we fear, okay? I mean, this is just what happens in the story. You know, the storm is going wild, the Californians are going crazy, the whole thing's going to pot, and you suddenly realize Jesus is bigger than the storm. He's just plain more powerful, more capable, more able to do what needs to be done than the storm itself is able to do. So you realize because he's more powerful, he in that sense is worthy of our fear. Um, he's also in some sense um, more terrible, more dreadful. Uh, and I know that isn't the way we like to think of him, but this language about God actually occurs a lot in scripture. So people see God and they're afraid they're going to die. They see God and they hide in a crack. Or God says, look, if you want to see me, Moses, great, but let me hide you in a crack and put my hand over you, and then you can look at me as I pass by. And you realize, oh, this is kind of fear, dread sort of language. Not just, hey, Jesus is really big, this is cool. But it's like, Jesus is almost too big. Rudolf Otto was a German theologian in the early 20th century. Um, and he wrote this uh, uh, marvelous book about the holiness of God. And he describes a response that, that people have in the face of what he called the numinous, the face of what we would simply call God, when you have this encounter with the transcendent and you're suddenly like, oh my gosh, he is so much bigger than anything I can do or imagine. And he talks about this as a sense of a need for covering. Um, you know, Adam and Eve in the garden, and they suddenly realize they're naked, and, they're, and, and they hear God calling, and they go and hide. They need to be covered from God. We hide in the crack. We fall on our face in the dirt. All of these sorts of responses are born of, in some sense, this authentic terror that comes when you suddenly realize God is this big, and I'm this big. Um, and usually that happens as you approach closer, and you see him better and you suddenly see yourself for who you are, and you see him for he is, and you see the gap. So that's part of why that gap is part of why we, we fear him. Another thing that Otto points out that's really interesting is the issue of the, the same sort of thing, but it's a gap relative to holiness and purity. So we see God, and we see this incredible, often imaged by light or whiteness or something like this, incredible moral purity. And then you look at yourself, and the term he is, you see yourself as profane. It isn't some particular sin you've done. It's this incredible feeling of, ah, I'm just a sin. All the way through, every time I try to do something good, there's half of it that's bad, and you just, you have a feeling of dirtiness in the prince of cleanness, a profaneness in the sense of holiness. Uh, the great example of this is Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. So you have this beautiful, you know, temple scene where, you know, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty and his glory uh, is filling the whole earth and his, you know, temple is, is being filled by God and the, the, you know, seraphim are going around and it's just this fantastic, glorious scene and then the camera pans down to Isaiah. <laughs> What's Isaiah doing? Yeah, pass the popcorn. No, he's not watching a superhero movie. 
He is cowering in the corner and saying, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips, and I have seen the living God. Woe is me. And that's that sense of, in some sense, when I stand before God, I suddenly find myself in some deep sense as being profane. Um, and the interesting thing about this passage is God doesn't respond to Isaiah's comment by saying, oh, Isaiah, calm down, chill out, buddy, not a big deal. No, he sends one of the angels to the altar with a pair of tongs to grab a hot coal. I just want you to stop and think about that. If the angel needs tongs, I'm guessing it's hot, okay? And he grabs the coal and he goes over there and he presses that coal to Isaiah's unclean lips. That's an image of cleansing that simply reinforces Isaiah's perception of distance between him and God, right? He doesn't wipe it away like, hey, no big deal. It's like, no, it is a big deal. The good news is my grace is bigger still. And that is the next reason why we might want to fear God is because of his grace. For all of the things I've just said, all of these reasons we should fear him, um, and all the times in Scripture where people do fear him, the thing that's so interesting is almost every time after somebody has the fear moment, it's followed up with a fear not message from God. Uh, in the case of Isaiah, it's in effect a fear not because I'm going to cleanse you. It can be a fear not because I'll lead you over, fear not because I'll be with you. Whatever the thing is, and it's always in the context of something that, as I've said, totally legitimate to be afraid of. We're about to cross into the promised land. I'm afraid that these guys are going to kill us. By the way, they can, okay? But fear not, for I'm with you. And so this is the message that we get from God, not as that there's nothing to fear, but the fear not comes because the presence of God, the connection between the fear and the fear not, isn't the falseness of your beliefs, but the grace of God who will be with you. Because I'm with you, you need not fear. If you start going without me, then I have all bets are off, because there's really things to fear out there. But the promise here is that you live and you walk with the fear not God. So that's, in a back-end way, part of why we fear him, because of his grace. Another thing that's interesting is God is devastatingly loyal to his word. So Deuteronomy chapter 8, they're about to enter the promised land, and they're going to have all these, you know, your flocks will increase, and your harvest will increase, and you'll build paneled homes, and you'll live in them, all these wonderful things will happen when they get to the promised land. And in Deuteronomy 8.18, God says, Remember the Lord your God, for it's he who gives you the power to get this wealth. Why? That he might confirm his covenant that he swore with his fathers. Why is all this wonderful stuff happening? God says, because I keep my word. I swore this covenant to your fathers. We're going to keep this covenant, and that's what's going to happen. I am loyal to my word. The only rub on that is, is he keeps talking. He says, if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you will surely perish. And of course, this is the story of the nation of Israel that does exactly that. And they are expelled from the images of the land, vomits them out because of their refusal to walk with God in the process. So it's a wonderful thing that God keeps his word, but you need to remember he keeps his word. He keeps his word. His words of blessing and his words of warning are both true words that he plans to keep. And this is a good reason to fear the Lord. Um, Another reason we fear him that's closely related to this is because he's wiser. So you get this clear image of God that we keep his, uh, we, 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 we follow his ways, we keep his commandments, we honor his covenant because he just knows better. These are things that lead us to blessing. So when we walk in those ways, good things happen. And because of our respect and regard for his wisdom, we follow in his ways. So these are all ways and reasons for which we might fear God. And the first concern I have for putting this into practice is that we get our fear in God rightly located. Second concern I have is that we have our trust, that we trust more in Jesus. You know, this is an interesting image. Uh, As I mentioned at the outset, he said, uh, we're headed to the other side. We are crossing over. Um, And at the end of the story, what's happened? They've crossed over. What happened in between? (laughs) Well, lots of things happened in between. But the point is, he said, you're going to the other side. And they made it to the other side. 
And you think of all these other little historical vignettes that follow in the book of Mark, and you see the same sort of pattern. Oh my gosh, instead of a storm, we have a guy who's oppressed by a demon. How will we get to the other side? Well, that means Jesus is going to have to liberate somebody from demonic oppression. We find someone who's sick. How will we get to the other side of sickness? By having him be the one who heals someone. We have someone who dies. How do we get to the other side? By him being the one who resurrects. And one of the incredible things that the gospel promises us, in an effect that Jesus always gets us to the other side. He always gets us to the other side. It doesn't matter if it's a storm. It doesn't matter if it's disease. It doesn't matter if it's demonic oppression. It doesn't matter if it's death. When Jesus says we're going to the other side, we're going to the other side. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Well, death is going down too because he's going to take us to the other side. So we can trust in his plan (laughs) because he's the one who's promised to take us to the other side. When the plan looks bad, just remember that just means the plan isn't over yet because the end of the plan will be the other side. Finally, uh, it isn't just a question of trusting Jesus more, but resting more in Jesus. Uh, You know, that image of them freaking out, Jesus, don't you care? And to be reminded of the fact with all of this stuff, this is part of why I want to save this to the end, all the things you've talked about of how big Jesus is and how worthy he would be to be feared in the kind of visceral sense of fear, the power that he has and all those things, the incredible thing about him, that's the same person who's mindful of us, who knew us when we were still in the womb and knit us together, who looked at us before one day had even happened, um, and he saw all of our days written in a book. It's a crazy thought. God looks at your life, your dismal, pathetic life, just like my dismal, pathetic life, and says, good book, let's publish it. He actually writes us into a book. He numbers the hairs on our head. Uh, He leads us in paths of righteousness. He restores our soul. What is man that you're mindful of us? That's the right question to ask. I have no idea what we are, but the point is he is mindful of us. He does care. And it's an amazing thing to get these two things together, the fear of God and the abiding care that God has for us. And I think that's a wonderful prompt for worshiping him, to realize that for all of his glory, for some unknown and untold reason, he values each one of us as human beings. He has a plan. He companions with us as we seek to follow him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for the reminders that we have as we look into it of who we are and who you are. And Lord, I just pray that those reminders would things that would help us to order our loves, to put them in the proper place with a proper sense of proportion. Lord, help us to fear you first. Help us to trust in your plan more and help us finally to rest in you because of the great love and concern you share for us. And we ask this now in Jesus' name, amen.